Chapter 33 Network CNN, ITN, BBC, NBC, and even the business news channel showed the live feed of Nick Cobb being dragged across the set. James, Mark and Adelaide were squeezed together on a sofa in Whitley Bay watching the story unfold. This is terrorism meets reality TV and the power of the web, the commentator said. Appalling and yet compelling in a way that makes you utterly unable to look away from the screen. James watched as Cobb was forced into the cage by Viv and two masked teenagers he'd met briefly the night before. Cobb's neck was locked into a brace so that his head poked between the bars and the door was slammed shut. This is exactly how they did it with the bunnies, Cobby, Viv explained. And I'd just like to emphasise that my colleagues and I have no medical training, just like the laboratory assistants at Malaric Research. The cage door slammed as Viv was handed a pint glass and a bottle of Cobb Cleanse. Mmm, pine fresh, Viv grinned as he squeezed the viscous blue liquid into the glass. Doesn't that make your tummy growl when you look at it? Maybe the viewers at home can place bets on whether you'll live or die. Or if you're watching via our website, why not vote in our online poll? Cobb moaned desperately as Viv pinched his nostrils together to force him to breathe through his mouth while one teenage assistant tried to prise his jaws apart and the other moved in with a feeding tube and funnel. Come on, Cobby Wobbly, Viv said exuberantly. Be a good bunny and eat all your din-dins. The picture on the little TV blacked out for a second before cutting to the face of a slightly startled newsreader. Well, it appears that our director has cut away from those deeply disturbing scenes but we will continue to follow this rapidly unfolding story. Mark flipped through all the news channels, but every news director in Britain and America had drawn the line at seeing a celebrity having a feeding tube forced down his throat. Adelaide tutted. We're only showing a procedure that happens to thousands of lab animals every day. Can we get the internet? James asked. Not in this flat. Adelaide said. There's not even a telephone. James shrugged. Does anyone fancy another cup of tea? Definitely, Adelaide grinned. Count me in, Mark nodded. Three sugars. James squeezed off the middle of the couch and wandered through to the kitchen. He filled up the kettle and tried to think as he watched it boil. He realised that he'd got too wrapped up in Liberation TV and hadn't put any serious thought into his main task. Finding a way of getting the information about Hummingbird Farm to Zara without endangering Kyle. Nobody at the farm had been in contact since they'd arrived at the flat. James figured they were all busy making the webcast and looking after their hostage. And besides... Why would they need to contact three people sitting in a safe house watching TV? As the kettle rumbled, James realised that a couple of factors were working in his favour. First, there was no landline in the house, and because mobile phones can be unreliable, the crew up at Hummingbird Farm probably wouldn't be suspicious if they couldn't get in touch with Mark or Adelaide. Second, Kyle was a top agent. He'd given James the location of the farm and would surely be taking steps to protect himself in the event that things went wrong. By the time James had poured the water in the teapot and grabbed the cups, he decided to move on Mark and Adelaide. The biggest problem was their guns. He knew Mark's gun was still zipped up in the bag of tennis equipment, which now sat beside the nest of tables in the living room. This meant James couldn't get hold of it but Mark wouldn't be able to get his hands on it quickly either. Adelaide's gun was trickier. James had no clue where it was, or even if she'd taken it out of the back of the motorbike. He decided to deal with her first. As the tea brewed, James searched through the kitchen drawers and found scissors and a ball of chunky nylon string. 
He gave it a good tug to make sure it was strong before slicing off half a dozen two metre lengths. He made each length into two loops and formed a noose at the top. Next, he grabbed the tea towel off its hook and soaked it under the tap before ringeing it out, folding it into quarters and leaving it on the countertop next to the string. The living room curtains were pulled to stop the afternoon sun bleaching out the TV picture. James strolled into the gloomy space and handed over the hot mugs. Cheers, James, Adelaide said. Anything happening? He asked. Mark shook his head. They're not showing any live footage. Just old farts sitting in the studio, speculating over what we're going to do next. Adelaide, James said. I think I've got this rash on my head, from the hair dye or something. Would you mind having a look at it? Sure, Adelaide said as she stood up. James headed through to the kitchen. Where are you going? It's lighter in the kitchen, James explained. Adelaide huffed reluctantly but followed after him. If your skin's reacting to the hair dye, it's probably easiest just to dive in the shower and wash it out. Adelaide was exactly the same height as James, and he didn't think she'd be difficult to take down. The tricky part was doing it without Mark overhearing. Sit in the chair or something then, Adelaide said. I can't see your head from all the way up there. What happened to your gun, by the way? James asked. Did you leave it in the bike? Adelaide looked surprised at the abrupt change in subject matter. It's here, she said, lifting up her shirt to reveal it tucked into the waistband of her sweatpants. As soon as James saw the gun, he grabbed the sodden tea towel off the cabinet top. He snatched Adelaide's wrist and twisted her arm up behind her back with one hand while bundling her forward and clamping the wet cloth over her mouth with the other. She ended up pressed against the wall with James holding her in an arm lock. A sharp backwards kick hit James in the knee, but it wasn't enough to knock him back. I can snap your arm like a twig, James whispered nastily, tightening the painful lock to make his point clear. Open your mouth. As Adelaide opened up, James forced the cloth into her mouth until it was completely crammed. Once he was sure the cloth wasn't coming out, he let go and pulled the gun out of Adelaide's waistband. Put your wrists together. James tucked the gun in the pocket of his shorts as he grabbed one of the loops of string off the countertop. He hooked a loop over each of Adelaide's hands before pulling the nooses tight and securing it with a constrictor knot. He glanced out into the corridor to make sure that Mark wasn't on the move before whispering in Adelaide's ear. I won't hurt you if you do what you're told, okay? Oof, Adelaide nodded. Walk into the living room with me, sit your ass in the armchair, and stay still. James grabbed the remaining loops of string off the countertop before shoving Adelaide towards the door. What the hell? Mark yelled, looking startled as he saw Adelaide with the soggy tea towel sticking out of her mouth. His eyes darted between James and the sports bag alongside his seat. You won't reach it in time. James said, gesturing with the gun and using the firm but slow voice he'd practiced in training. Take this and tie Adelaide's ankles together. Listen, James, Mark said. I know you're young, and I guess seeing it all on TV has made you scared, but running away from us isn't going to help. The best way to stay out of trouble is if everyone sticks to the plan. Thank you for your input. James said. Now take the piece of string and tie Adelaide's ankles together, or I'll shoot you. Mark put his arm up on the back of the couch and smiled confidently. There's no shame in being scared, James, but this is silly. None of us is going to get caught so long as we stick to the plan. The TV pundits were droning in the background. 
The police have asked us not to broadcast any live footage from the Animal Freedom Army webcast at this time, but we can tell you that Nick Cobb has had a tube forcibly inserted into his stomach and has been force-fed approximately one pint of cleaning fluid. At this stage, we're not clear how damaging the fluid will be, but our doctor here in the studio has indicated that the dosage could be fatal if he doesn't receive medical treatment within two or three hours. The words made James realise that he didn't have time for a debate with Mark. Fine, James yelled as he lunged forwards. I've tried being nice. It's extremely awkward to hit a person who is sitting on a low couch, especially if they've got gangly arms and legs in the way. James propped his knee on the sofa and swung the gun at Mark's head. But the punch missed and Mark managed to get an arm around James's back. The badly aimed punch might have cost James against a powerful opponent like Viv, but Mark was scrawny and James managed to wriggle out of the clumsy hold and land a better punch with his empty hand. It connected with the side of Mark's head and the follow-up loosened a couple of teeth as the gun smashed into his mouth. But Mark wasn't unconscious and he struggled as James threaded loops over his hands and secured his arms behind his back. Now look at the state of you, James said angrily. And whose fault is it? James stood up and realised that his tennis shirt was spattered with blood. He found Mark's phone stuck between two sofa cushions and waved the gun at his bound up victims before heading out into the hallway. I've been nice so far, James warned, but if I hear so much as a squeak, I'm putting bullets through both your heads. James went out into the hallway. He flipped open the mobile and dialed Zara. James, thank God. Are you safe? For now, James said, as he noticed beads of blood welling up on his knuckles. I'm in some flat in Whitley Bay. Nick Cobb is being held at Hummingbird Farm near Rothbury, and Kyle's up there too.